There was one spiritual teacher who uh, I read. It was an internet article. Mm, oh, God, how long ago was it? Uh, 20 years, maybe? 15 to 20 years ago. And his name was Douglas Adams. Or another name just came in. I used to look at a lot of these spiritual teachers. Another guy was called Sailor Bob. Are they the same person? Douglas Adams taught something called the Headless Way. And he kept trying to figure out... Um, well, I always say, you, you, basically what you are is you're a spot of awareness. And you ride around, usually up here behind your eyes. And um, maybe in the Headless Way, you're going to build... A body around this awareness. I've got heartburn from eating. Sorry. So you build a, a, a head around your awareness, and the head's got ears, eyes, and then uh, you've got this jaw, and you're able to talk. And you know, as humans, we always think, well, it's us that's talking. But the more you meditate, uh, and you focus on you being the awareness watching everything from inside the head, you come to the conclusion that um, some other thing is talking through this head. It's not you, the awareness. Someone says it's memories. Well, sometimes something puts it all together. Somebody uh, that's very scientific says it's just your brain and, you know, your brain is odd if you look at it it's got a brain stem and a reptilian brain and then a mammalian brain and like a bird cerebellum and then it's got the forebrain which is kind of human so you got a mo and then you got a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere and they're connected by uh, nerves called the corpus callosum and you got a pineal gland in here um, and you've got a pituitary gland in there, the master gland. And maybe it's because there's so many parts that make up your brain. And then some other teachers say, well, there's more neurons in your belly than there are in your brain. So it's like the primary brain of your body is down here in your belly. And in the Chinese teachings, it's called the Hara, H-A-R-A. So, you know, when you meditate, do you want to meditate up here on your pineal gland, or do you want to meditate here on your hara, your belly? Try both, see what happens for you. But in the headless way, now they're saying maybe it was Sailor Bob Adams, but you can look him up on the internet rather than trying to find a book about him, and you can see it's kind of I think he draws pictures trying to get his point across. But the point for him was he didn't have a head. Everything sort of was like in concertic, concertic circles that keep going out further beyond his body. Um, so everything is sort of centered here on your point of awareness. Someone says a point of focus where your awareness picks it all up and usually you know if you're visual even when i close my eyes i seem to be down there now if i try and put my consciousness down here into my belly i can feel down here but i seem to still have my point of awareness up here uh the french uh mathematician and philosopher rene descartes said that the seat of the soul is here in your pineal gland if you look at um, the painting Michelangelo did, or it was Leonardo da Vinci did, I think so. One of those guys, uh, and they painted the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel at the Vatican in Rome. Um, they seem to have known about this because a lot of pictures uh, on the ceiling have to do with... Uh, brain like the brain like a cross-section of the brain showing the pineal gland 
Somebody else wants to remind me that the eye of Horus uh, pretty much is also like I like a cross section of the brain showing the pituitary gland. Somebody wants to remind me that we got it all wrong. The Bible is not a story about Jesus a man. It's uh, about the maybe the psychic centers of the body that somebody is trying to link up to the chakra centers. And it's about um, different fluids of the body um, creating a masterpiece of you. Somebody wants to remind me that uh, the story of Jesus seemed to be copied by uh, whoever wrote the Bible from earlier stories about someone who was born of a virgin. Um, perhaps it's something to do with ancient Egypt and uh, um, something to do with the winter solstice. Uh, that the sun stops and then it starts going back the other direction. The reason that they set uh, Jesus' birthday, the 25th of December, at that time was because that was a previous pagan holiday that had to do with the winter solstice. I'm being asked, what is the perennial philosophy? It's like uh, some guy named Thoreau. Thoreau. He was an American and he hung out at a cottage by Walden Lake. What is the perennial philosophy? Don't be dumb, someone says. I used to know somebody not really know them. I played soccer and they run a different team, but that was this person's nickname. The person uh, um, was very bright and went to university and studied psychology and then went off to uh, do some extra stuff. And um, I mean, they used the nickname perennial, which I always meant. Um, must have, it must have meant perennial philosophy. What is the perennial philosophy? There's another book that's coming to mind, a 1902 book by Maurice Buck, B-U-C-K-E. He was a Canadian doctor. Uh, he worked in an insane asylum around Toronto, Canada. And uh, in this book, he talks about people in history who he believed had been um, enlightened, like Jesus and Paul of Tarsus, Swedenborg, um, maybe some other authors. It's a very interesting book, and it's, you know, 115 years old. And if you want to get an idea of what uh, how smart people were in 1902, get a copy of that book. You probably can get it in ebook form for free. Cosmic consciousness is what it was called. He has some interesting ideas. Um, Walt Whitman was one of the people he mentioned. His book was Leaves of Grass. Uh, Buck said, generally speaking, this cosmic consciousness comes on later in life. And uh, in 1902, uh, I don't think he mentioned any women. So in 1902, uh, 
our society was pretty much male dominated. Were there enlightened women? Oh yes, there were, but he didn't talk about them. Uh, female saints of the Catholic Church, I would say, would be these enlightened ones. But he didn't talk about them. He talked about what he thought was uh, the evolution of color vision in humans. He looked way back to ancient Greece, and he thought that the ancient Greeks were colorblind between green and blue. They couldn't tell the difference. Because way back then, I don't know what the color was, but he couldn't find one of those two colors. So he said it came on later. In other words, humans were still evolving and color vision um, improved over the, I don't know how many years ago. Because Jesus was at the time of Rome and the Greeks were before Rome. And the ancient Egypt, Egyptians were before Greece. So, I mean, human history goes back a long time. Some of the people that came out of uh, India didn't really go with the Hindu religion and the Hindu gods. They were called enlightened sages, but they had nothing at all to do with Hindu gods. They talked about the self. That's all they called it. Capital S E L F. And this group uh, usually is called Advaita Vedanta. And I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right or wrong, but that's how it looks to me when I read it in English. And uh, one of those sages um, said, um, what you have to do is keep asking yourself the question, what am I? And keep doing that. Keep asking yourself the question, what am I? Oh, day after day, day after day, that's all you do. Uh, mm -hmm. Dr. David R. Hawkins read this and he said, because he was, according to him, enlightened, and he said, the question, uh, who am, was it who am I or what am I? Dr. Hawkins said, I think he said, what am I, rather than who am I? I think he said, it's going to give you a better answer if you say, someone else says, where am I? Well, that's interesting. Where are you? Are you the center of your universe, Mr. Truman Show, Mr. Groundhog Day? Yes, is the answer. What about all those other people around you? Uh, they're the star of their own movie. And some of those uh, movie stars, um, you know, in their world, you don't mean anything. You're nothing to them. Uh, the spiritual teacher Joel S. Goldsmith said one of his teachings of the infinite way or the mystical eye, I think it was in the mystical eye, is that there is an eye in everyone. Every human, I'm going to add, probably in every animal, every tree. My friend Jacob Being is going to say, even in things like, um, even in things like, Gumby here, there's an eye, and we're all one thing appearing as a multitude. I gotta go because I'm up to 15 minutes. Please subscribe and share, and I'll talk to you some more about Mr. Gumby and the Eye.